it has been a while since we've caught up. And one of the other things I was really excited about is the native advertising staff guidance. That There was a workshop mm -hmm. two years ago. Mm -hmm. I participated in that. We've been waiting and waiting. Right. And almost two years to the date, um, the, the native advertising guidance was delivered in December. Um, but one of the things we were really surprised to see is it's not just staff guidance. Um, but it came with an enforcement policy statement, and we have not seen one of those in, I think, since Made in USA. I mean, it's, it's been a good long time. Um, I suppose that's true. The green guides are guides, but mm -hmm. um, clearly... Testimonial guides. True, yeah. but clearly we've been enforcing yes. uh, uh, based on those guides. So um, I suppose it's true on some level that many of the guides that we get, we send out are not termed enforcement policy. And not force of law. And well, um, but the re so the reason, if you take a step back and you think about what we've been saying with respect to native, native advertising, the big message is that consumer protection principles dealing with advertising, dealing with, you know, telling consumers you're engaged in one kind of a transaction, but actually it's something else. These are very long-standing principles. Mm -hmm. So what we were trying to say is we are now going to be applying these principles in new tech and new business models involving native advertising. So think about it. Door-to-door -door salesmen who used to, you know, knock on a door and say, you've won a prize, but really what they're doing is selling encyclopedias. Or moving even to a much more modern era, uh, search results, where the search results actually are not um, organic, as they say, but in fact have been paid for. We have in all of these circumstances either brought cases or issued guidelines to say, no, you've got to clearly disclose if that search result is in fact something that has been paid for. So this is taking all of those principles and placing it into the native advertising space. And why do we care? Why did we have the workshop? As you know, native advertising is really growing. Maybe it's because of all the ad blocking going on, but maybe it's because um, it's relatively inexpensive, it scales really well, it can be individualized. Again, the ad tech industry is one of the most technologically sophisticated industries that we have in our country. It's so it scales well, and um, it's effective. So that's one of the reasons why I think um, we're seeing much more of it. Um, it's, it's very useful online, it's very useful for new media, and it's a way that media can try to monetize uh, when they have maybe had less success in other, in other ways. So it's, it's important, it's burgeoning, it's something that we felt we needed to step into. But we wanted to make a statement that these principles about, you know, Telling consumers you're engaged in one thing, but actually it's something else, are real and important and apply. So to tell consumers or to give consumers the impression that what they're reading is editorial content from the publisher, when in fact it's really an ad, uh, even if it's written up as a story, even if it's des mm -hmm. designed to look exactly like a story that was written by the publisher that appears right next to it, if it's really an advertisement, we think that that needs to be clearly disclosed. And in the, in the enforcement statement, what we do is we give a description about the ways in which um, consumers can be adequately informed about these issues. We think it's very important. I think the fact that it's an enforcement policy statement versus guides probably is significant. It, ca it came from the commission mm -hmm. as opposed to from staff. Um, and I think that all, all of the commissioners feel strongly about it. Okay. The, um, now, you know, the last time we were together, uh, we were talking before BAA about preparing for meetings before the commission and right. how to best advocate. And there was something that you said that really stuck with me. And you said that one of the parties that's not represented at a meeting with the commissioner is the consumer. And that you really feel that you try to be the voice of the consumer. Um, and that idea really stuck with me. And I just, I wanted you to flesh that out a little bit for me. Sure, sure. Well, so one of the things that I think is very important about being a commissioner, and I have always had this policy, is it's really important to have an open door policy. You know, anyone who wants to come speak with you about anything, you know, that's a legitimate topic of conversation, you know, you need to talk to them. And I do. I, I reach out to all sorts of stakeholders, you know, um, business community, consumer advocates, um, academics, researchers, technologists in this country and abroad. Because I think it's really important to inform my work, 
um, to help resolve problems, but also to let people know that we're listening. I think that that's really important. So what I was referring to, I mean, I, I have lots of consumer groups that come in, lots of consumer advocates that come in, and I enjoy speaking with them just as much as I enjoy speaking with the business community, and I do that all the time. But we have meetings with parties over actions that we're contemplating taking. The, this happens on the consumer protection side, it happens with respect to advertising, it happens with respect to privacy, with telemarketing, it happens on the competition side. We meet with parties all the time, whether it's a merger matter or an anti-competitive practices matter. Who's in the room at those meetings? You've been at those meetings, you know who's in the room. It will be the party that we're thinking of suing, or the parties, uh, it will be staff, it will be our uh, attorneys, as well as our economists. Sometimes the party will bring in their outside experts so we can hear from them. And then it will be myself and my staff. And I'm very cognizant of the people that aren't in the room. And the people that I think of first and foremost as not being in the room are the consumers who might be affected by whatever activity it is that we're talking about. So I try to keep in mind as I'm listening to the conversation, well, what is the impact of what we're talking about? You know, I'm hearing about the concerns from the business side, and that's very important, but I also want to put on the table to hear the response, the issues around, well, what's the impact on consumers? I, I consider that a central part of my job, actually, and I, I, I hope my fellow commissioners do, and I think, I think it is, one of the ways that you can be most effective is to be thinking about not only who you're hearing from, but who you're not hearing from. Put yourself in the shoes with your new shoes if you ever buy them <laughs> from the internet that are following you of, of the consumer. You know, there's, a, there's an old saying uh, that I, I heard um, which has been significant to me throughout my life and that is, you know, it really pays uh, in terms of your effectiveness and in terms of your empathy to walk a mile in someone else's shoes and to really try to understand what it is that they have to go through in any situation, whether it's dealing with a telemarketer, looking at advertising, how would they understand it, or whatever. I, I, I think that's pretty good advice. That makes a lot of sense. Well, it was so great to catch up. Thank Absolutely. you for meeting me for coffee, and I hope we can do this again soon. Absolutely. It would be great.